morning and welcome to the DBHDS Provider Roundtable. Today is February 14, 2024. A few reminders while we're still admitting others into the meeting. The PRT has two sections. The top portion of the agenda are the presentations that we will have. And we hope that you've read the departmental updates, which are at the bottom of the pages, the subsequent pages. We will ask you to put your questions in the chat due to the amount of presentations that we have today. And we have made time to answer some of those questions at the end. For those that we do not get to, we will have the Q&A posted on our website. And you may reach out to your regional CRC and we can direct your question to the proper persons for an answer. And we'll give one more minute and then we'll start. Thank you. Someone is saying there's an echo. Is that anyone else having an echo? I'm not. This is Barry. I'm not having an echo. I'm not having an echo as well, Sophia. Thank you. Okay. Barry, we can go to the next slide if Barry is with us. Um, I think we can move on and uh, when Heather can join, we'll jump back to her slide. That's fine. Diane, if you're available, you will be next, please. Happy Valentine's Day. This is Diane Gordon from DMAS. Um, I just had a couple of quick things to share with the provider community um, that are coming out of our agency. So um, the first one is in-home supports. So back in May of last year, there was a guidance document that was submitted um, for providers to use as, as um, a, a, to provide guidance, of course, um, on in-home support services. So I wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, the first one is that parents of minor children and spouses cannot provide in-home support services as part of the LRI program. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about the LRI program, but of course that's the legally responsible individuals um, who um, under regulation would normally not be able to provide paid support, but were able to under Appendix K. In-home support is not a part of Appendix K, it never was, and it is not allowable. Um, so parents of minor children and spouses are not able to provide in-home support to their um, individuals that they are legally responsible for. The other part about in-home support services is to clarify that it is an active service. So that means that during provision of in-home support services, it is expected that the individual will be actively engaged in activities related to the ISP. Um, the individual cannot be sleeping. Um, of course, the staff themselves cannot be sleeping. So um, just to, to make sure that I clarify that, and if you um, need a copy of that guidance document, please feel free to reach out and I can put the email address in the chat where, and I can give that to you. But I know Eric also sent out a reminder um, a few, uh, last week, I think, um, uh, to the, attach the guidance document for, for everyone's reference. Um, I wanted to also, um, 
touch a little bit upon objective written documentation. Nicole DeStefano is going to give more specifics about this, but as it relates to in-home support services, if it's an adult individual who is receiving in-home support services through the DD waiver, and that um, adult lives with the person who is going to be providing their support, objective written documentation is required. So again, objective written documentation is required any time a family member who resides under the same roof as an individual will be providing support to that individual. So um, Nicole will provide you with more details in a bit. Then I also just wanted to touch um, very briefly on the Legally Responsible Individuals, the LRI program. That is, um, changes to that program are set to go into effect beginning March 1st. Um, folks who are currently providing attendant care to their minor child or to their spouse under DD waiver must have an extraordinary care form submitted to DMAS as well as a plan of care. Um, how it works is that once we get that um, extraordinary care form and we get the um, plan of care, then we notify CDCN or the other fiscal agent that the attendant can continue to provide paid supports um, through CDCN after March 1st. Um, if we do not have that information on file, the attendant will not be able to get paid after March 1st. And I know that there's a lot of um, things, you know, a lot of communication going back and forth about some things that are happening within the General Assembly. But just so that folks understand, anything that is passed um, through the General Assembly has to be um, has to be okayed through CMS. And we need to make sure that we are changing our regulatory language as well. And that's going to take some time. So um, please do not delay if you are, are aware of a um, in, an individual who is receiving paid support from a family member uh, who is a legally responsible individual. Um, please get that documentation in as soon as possible so that we can go ahead and notify CDCN that that attendant can continue to get paid. I'm going to put an, um, two email addresses in the chat. You can reach out to the DD waiver team here at DMAS through either one of them, um, but there is one specific to um, the LRI program. So I'll put those in the chat for you. Any questions or concerns, don't hesitate to reach out to us. And then the last thing I wanted to talk a little bit about was the DD waiver line. Um, again, there was something that had come out during uh, through listserv and it was a who to contact form and it provided information about how providers um, can seek assistance for various issues such as provider enrollment or billing issues. Um, and what we have found recently is that there are a number of individuals who, when they renew their Medicaid, their DD waiver level of care has been knocked out of the system. Um, that doesn't mean that the person has lost the waiver. It just means that we need to go back in and put the waiver, we, we call it the waiver line, or the level of care, we just need to put that waiver line or level of care back into the system so that the individual remains on DD waiver. And there was a uh, the last page of the who to contact sheet that was sent out again via the listserv, gave some information about how to um, assist if that happens with one of the individuals that you're working with. Um, and also you can reach out to the email address that I'll put in the chat if this ever becomes an issue and you need some assistance with it. Um, and then also wanted to talk a little bit about another issue that's been coming up with that DD waiver level of care. Sometimes when individuals go to the hospital or admitted to a long-term care facility for a temporary short period of time, their level of care will change and it will change to a long-term care level, level of care. Um, and we need to go back in and put the DD waiver line back in. Um, but one of the other things that has been happening is that sometimes when DD waiver individuals are hospitalized, the care team at the hospital does not know that that individual has DD waiver and will sometimes offer them the CCC plus waiver. And what ends up happening is that the individual's DD waiver level of care line is removed and replaced with CCC plus. Um, and that's not because the individual has chosen to change waivers. It's because the hospital thinks they're helping the individual access services by enrolling them in CCC plus. So for those of you who um, have individuals who are in the hospital, 
Um, and for support coordinators, we're just asking that if that were to happen, um, if your individuals are hospitalized for, you know, a period of time, not just, you know, for a quick stay, but for a couple of days or weeks, um, that there's some communication with the hospital just so that they are aware that it is somebody with a DD waiver um, and they don't inadvertently disenroll them from DD waiver into CCC+. And again, don't fear, if it does happen, we can fix it very easily. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead now and put that information in the chat. And if you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to take those as well. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Diane. And the document that Diane mentioned, um, who to contact, it's in the agenda. If you go all the way to the bottom of the departmental, um, updates, you'll see that document and you can read it further and contact those emails that she's given us if you have further questions. Next, we have um, Nicole Estefano, who is the Waiver Operations Director. Nicole? You're muted. We can't hear you. I'm not hearing you, Nicole. I think you are speaking. Nicole, if you want to run down to my office. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. You're welcome. <laughs> You're off mute. Hey, everybody. Sorry for the technical um, issues there. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Great. For some reason, it had me off mute, but I was not off mute. The only thing I wanted to add to uh, what Diane stated is that last year we sent out the OWD um, optional guidance form and we made um, just a small little tweaks to it. So we'll be sending that out again to on the listserv to everybody, but we wanted to incorporate the confusion there was specific to just service facilitation, but actually that form is for any service that um, hires any family member or in persons to help the individual who live in that home. So we'll be sending that out and you'll see a little update on it about all services in provider name, not just specific to service facilitation. And that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And that form is also included in our departmental updates. So as you look through the document, You'll be able to see it there. If you have questions, let us know. And Nicole will answer those when we're at the Q&A portion. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you. And Heather is with us now, so we will go to that next portion of our meeting. Just switching seats with Nicole. Uh, <laughs> um, my update is short and sweet. We were supposed to have our contempt hearing on January 29th. That was postponed due to um, an emergency with one of the parties. And so we have a status conference on the 20th and we will um, know then what the outcome of that is. Uh, Brianna, you have your hand up if you wanted to come off mute and ask a question. Or you can always put questions in the chat and happily look at them there. And Michelle told me they will have to put it in chat because you actually cannot come off mute. So sorry. All right, not seeing any questions. I will go ahead, Sophia, and turn it back to you. I really don't have any other updates at this time. Um, hey, thank you very much, Heather. And if we you. see that question, we'll reach out to you before we are. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Next, we have Behavioral Services with Nathan Abel. 
Good morning, everybody. Nathan Hobble here at DBHDS. I'm going to speak to you today about uh, quality assurance with therapeutic behavioral consultation waiver service, as well as getting folks connected in a timely manner. You can go to the next slide, please. So as I've talked about in previous updates, we continue to use a tool that we created called the Behavior Support Plan Adherence Review Instrument to determine if behavior plans, functional behavior assessments, and other related documentation that are required for therapeutic behavioral consultation meet the DBHDS and DMS practice guidelines. I gave highlights on the 23rd study period report in the previous presentation. Um, so I'm not going to reiterate that, but I'll just note that where we stand now as the Commonwealth is that six out of eight compliance indicators that are related to behavioral services have been met at least once. And if you're not familiar, I would encourage you to go and check out the 23rd study period report. We can make sure that that's included as a link, uh, but it's also available on the DPHDS website and the DOJ document library. So the tool that we use, um, the, the acronym we use is called the BASPARI. It's a weighted scoring system that determines adherence to these guidelines that are linked here. Uh, the most recent data set and aggregate that we have was the about half of the programs that we reviewed were in adherence with the practice guidelines. And then there's a, a breakdown here on um, some central tendency information like mean, median, and then the range. If you think about what a bell curve looks like in your head, the median is higher than the average there. So that indicates that there are um, the frequency of higher number scores is it's over on the, the high end, which is where we want it to be. And we've seen improvement in these scores over time as well. Our baseline when we first started reporting this was that 13% of programs reviewed were in adherence. So we're seeing nice growth. If anybody is interested in downloading the tool or looking at the scoring instructions, you can visit this website. Um, and the website also is chock full of other information, including a search engine that I'm going to talk about in just a moment and links to literature and other resources that might be helpful to you. And I'll just note as well before we move on to the next slide, uh, we recently published an article in a scholarly journal about public policy and quality assurance and behavioral services and breaks down how we developed this tool and also reviews other quality review tools. If anybody's interested in learning more about that, I'm happy to share a read only link. My email address will be included at the end of my little component here, so you can just shoot me an email and I'll send that along to you. Next slide, please. All right, so what you're seeing here is a graph over time of the percentage of people that are connected to this service based off of the need being identified at their ISP meeting. So there was a very small baseline several years ago of uh, 16 people, and, and none of those 16 people at that time were connected to this service within 30 days. So we've made a variety of Im improvements on our data um, and other variables that we thought might be contributing to people not getting connected, including provider growth, reimbursement rates for providers, information sharing with CSBs and support coordinators. And where we are now is that around 75% of people that need this service are getting connected to it within 30 days. <clears throat> Our benchmark is that 86% are going to be connected within 30 days. And of course, we want to meet and exceed that. So again, seeing nice improvement over time, there's still room for improvement to reach that benchmark. My suggestion to anybody that is not a provider, or excuse me, is a provider that is not included on our search engine is to go to the website and complete the form to become included on that search engine. It's totally optional, by the way, but it could help you um, get connected to somebody that needs your services. And my suggestion to anybody uh, that's trying to locate somebody to provide this service is to review the search engine and use it as a resource. We update it pretty frequently to include new providers and also providers that might not necessarily be new to the waiver system, but they've expanded to another region. Uh, and there's filters on the search engine where you can search region by region. We also recently added a new filter related to being able to search by CSB, where the provider delivers services face-to-face -face by CSB. So that might be something that's of use to folks. So please go ahead and, and check out that search engine if you're not familiar. Next slide. 
This is just a reiteration for me to make my plug about the search engine. So please go ahead and check it out, as I just noted. And uh, the behavioral services website contains the search engine, contains a link to that form if you're a provider of the service and you want to be listed on the search engine, or if you're already on the search engine and you need your information changed. And we have a lot of tra uh, training videos that we've created on our own and also partnered with best practice leaders in the field that are available for free. Um, and information on quality assurance that I talked about as well. So if anybody wants to learn more, please shoot me an email. My colleague Brian Phelps' email is also here as well, and you can email him if you need a, assistance or support in anything related to therapeutic behavioral consultation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nathan. Appreciate your information. And now we'll move to Sarah, supported decision making. Thank you, Sophia. I am just here this morning to make everyone aware that um, for this year, we have a training schedule for supported decision making. Um, if you can go to the next slide, it will provide some information. So um, every month we will be offering one training, um, but there's three different sessions and they will be going through on a quarterly basis. So one session relates to supported decision making where we go over the basics of supported decision making and then Virginia's supported decision making agreement um, that is meant for uh, support coordinators or people working at the CSB as well as providers. Then we will also offer a similar session where we cover um, that information, but more geared towards individuals and families. So um, feel free to pass that information along um, about the training to those that you support. And then the third session that we will be offering relates to decision making options in Virginia. So we have the supported decision making agreement, um, but there are a lot of other ways that people get support with making decisions. Um, it's not just guardianship or supported decision making. There are definitely um, there's a spectrum of different options. So in that third training, we will be going over um, that full spectrum and what the options are and how people access them. If you want to register, there is the QR code, but I will also put the link in the chat for you um, to get to the more information about these sessions as well as the links to register. So thank you guys and I hope to see you all throughout the year. Thank you, Sarah. For those of you inquiring about these slides, we will make it available through the listserv after this meeting. Thank you. And next we have um, Dee Dee Thomas, who is with the waiver program, better known as WAMS. Thank you. Good morning, Judy. If you're speaking, we can't hear you. I was on, on mute. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, ma'am. Thank All you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Happy Valentine's Day. Um, I'm here to talk to you a little bit about the new provider role that we're going to have in WAMS. You can go ahead and go to the next slide. So um, currently we have three roles in WAMS, um, provider roles, and they are the provider admin role, the ISP approval role, and a billing role. Um, so what we're doing is adding a new role, and it's going to be called provider organization, and it's going to be effective April 1st. And the purpose for this role is so that we um, can have someone who's responsible for administering the organization's details and WAMs. Um, so that would be all of the information that the on the organization level as opposed to an individual level. Um, so who should have this role? It would be the person that is responsible for making changes on an organization level, whether it be for administering um, new staff or you know adding new staff or basically assigning roles or adding information about your organization you can go to the next slide so the roles and responsibilities for this new role would allow full access in WAMS for the general information so you can update your business name your um, url the point of contact, the addresses for your organizations, um, if you have more than one site, telephone numbers, email addresses, service areas, and even the bay capacity if necessary. Next slide. 
And this is basically a, a little graphic of where you would do that um, information or um, make adjustments to that information in WAMS. Um, you can see like for the providers, there's an option um, on the right hand side for that, um, that graphic there, there's a way to edit the bed capacity. You can go to the next slide. So in addition to being able to modify the information for the role for the organization, um, this person in this role is also responsible for administering the staff access. Um, so that means adding new users, assigning roles, and also making sure that, for instance, when someone leaves the organization, um, that you also remove that, that individual. Um, also, cons what's also in this role, <laughs> additional responsibilities, would be the same as the provider admin role. And one of the things that you, that you should remember or keep in mind is that the provider admin role is not going away. We're just taking the organization owner own role to another level to be able to make those changes. So this role will also be able to do the, the typical things that a provider admin role would do for the individuals, which means adding services to the service authorization, um, also creating that customized rate application, and also the ISP approval role um, will also have those capabilities as well, which includes adding the part five to the ISP, as well as adding an interim part five. Next slide. So how do you get this new role and, and how do you update the system? Um, what we're asking folks to do, and, and some of you have actually already done this, is to complete a form online. And that is only one person from the organization needs to complete the form. And so if you are the person who is responsible for making changes on the organization level in WAMS, then you should complete this form. Only one form is necessary per, per organization. And one of the things to also keep in mind is with this new role, no more than two people can be assigned to this role at one time. So um, there are only two people from the entire organization. So this form, you would go ahead and complete it for the owner and the person who's going to be considered the backup. Um, so if you don't have a backup, that information is not required, but you do need to complete it for at least one person in the organization. Also on the form is an attestation. Um, so you wanna complete that. And then once you submit the form, we need you to complete this information no later than March 15th, but the sooner the better would be great. Um, go ahead and go to the next slide. So the information that we need included on the form would be mostly the information that we need what you have in WAMS. So that's gonna be your first and your last name, your WAMS login name, the tax ID for the organization, as well as the email address that's listed. And also to complete the attestation um, for both the owner uh, or the designee or, or the backup. Next slide. The attestation is basically saying that you attest that only the provider owners or their designee will have will be assigned this new role that their WAMS login or your your WAMS login will not be shared that there are not going to be more than two people assigned to this role at any one time um, and that each person that's uh, that is assigned to this role will also attest to all of those things that was just mentioned next slide then once that form is submitted, the information is going to be verified. Um, there's not anything else that you need to do. You don't need to go in and into WAMS and, and make the change yourself. Um, anyone that's designated on that form, including the backup, will be updated by the system automatically. And this is all going to happen um, by April 1st. Um, so if you have the provider admin currently assigned and you now are needing this new provider role, 
then the provider admin and the ISP approver is going to be removed because all of those features that allow you to do what you need to do for those roles are going to be included in the provider organization owner role. Now, again, keep in mind that that provider admin role is not going away. So if you're not responsible for monitoring or administering for your organization, you will still have that provider admin role and still be able to create the service or add services to the service authorization, um, create the customized rates application, those type of things. Um, once all of the roles are updated by the system, you'll receive an email basically saying that your role has been updated. And the only thing that you'll need to do is make sure that you go in and double check and make sure that everything is working the way it needs to work. Um, and of course, if there are any issues, you can contact the WAMS help desk and they'll be able to assist you. Um, if you have any questions about this process, my email is listed there. I can also put it in the chat. Next slide. All right, now last but not least, going forward, um, the person that's in this role will be responsible for making changes in the future. So if you need someone else to have this role or you know, maybe the individual, your backup is now gonna be somebody different, then you need to go in and um, make those changes yourselves. Um, the WAMS help desk will not be doing those things. So everything that needs to be done from this point forward will need to be done in WAMS. So that includes updating any of the contact information um, and basically administering um, the whole purpose for the role, adding new users, removing users, assigning roles, those type of things. Um, also for any new providers that are coming on board um, to provide new services, they don't, they don't have an account, um, they're brand new. We do have a process in place for when they register for the account and upon registering, they will also need to complete an attestation. Um, and then from that point on, they'll be able to add new and remove users and assign roles to those type of things. Um, next slide. Yeah. All right. If you have any questions, by all means, put them in the chat. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you, Judy. Eric, if you can give Natasha Cooper access to unmute, please. We have a special guest from the ARC of Central Virginia, um, Natasha Cooper, who will be talking to us about peer mentoring. So just give us a moment and we will have her able to communicate with us. I think I'm in there. Yes, you are. Good morning. Welcome. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you. Um, so as she said, I'm Natasha Cooper. I work at the ARC of Virginia. Um, we are the state chapter and we partner with DBHDS to do all things peer mentoring for the entire state. Um, so next slide, please. Just to give a little bit of information about the service, it was added to the waiver in 2016. Um, as I said, we partner with DBHDS, a little more specifically IFSP um, and the women over there. We work really closely with just to roll this out. Um, the, it is a short term service. So mentees receive 60 hours over the course of six consecutive months to work with a mentor of their choosing. It is available not only to people who have the DD waiver, but also to people who have the DD waiver wait or who are on the DD waiver wait list can also access this service. Next slide, please. So all of the mentees, there's kind of minimal requirements. Like I said, they just have to have a DD waiver or be on the DD waiver wait list, be at least 16 years of age, have a goal that can include building independence, employment, 
or anything for social opportunities um, for like a quick content consultation once we receive a referral for a mentee we just reach out to the primary contact and talk and explain to them a little bit about the service ask them what their goals might be and see if it's something that they want to explore and if they say yes then we spend a little bit more time just kind of getting to know them and assisting with the matches so that often looks like once we gather information about that person, we can recommend uh, certain mentors that are available that might be a good fit. They can also look at the website, which has photos and bios written by mentors and see if there's other people they want to meet. All the mentees are, they're welcome and encouraged to meet as many mentors for an introduction meeting as they would like to determine who would be the best fit for them. Next slide, please. Mentors do go through a two-day training and some tests, so they are considered credentialed peer mentors. They do have to be at least 21 years old, have a disability, used a support at some point in their lives and have lived independently within the community for at least a year. In addition to their initial training, we provide ongoing uh, quarterly workshops. So they're invited to four professional development workshops a year. And be because they are considered direct support professionals, they, are all, they also receive supervision with the provider that they are employed at. Um, and mentors are chosen by a mentee. So like we said, there's no just assigning mentors to mentees. Mentees get to make the final decision on who they want to work with. Next slide, please. It is a virtual service. Um, it can be done in person. It can be done virtually. Of course, one of the benefits to it being virtual is that mentees can select the best mentor for him or her from across the entire state. It doesn't just have to be someone who's within their area. Um, and then naturally, if it's in person, typically it does um, have to be someone who can get to and from. And the mentee would also have to be able to get to and from wherever the activity is going to be. Next slide, please. So a lot of the questions that we get asked are what happens after the 60 hours. And I won't go into like all the details, but we do have the matches um, that have come to an end officially. And we have a couple of people who have just decided to stay friends. So there are now a natural support to that mentee and they are friends forever. Um, we also have had a, a family offer to private pay a mentor to continue working with the mentee because they were just seeing so much progress. Um, and then friends and peers. So we've even had a match where instead of me doing all the presentations, a mentee and her mentor are able to complete this presentation um, for people who are interested. So that's been great success in terms of continuing that relationship after the 60 hours. And it's not something that just like completely ends. So happy to share that. Next slide, please. These are all the credentialed mentors to date that are essentially active. All the mentors that you see their names in orange have been hired by a provider. We currently work with two providers, the Arc of Southside and Mitchell Residential Solutions. Um, and of course, we are open to working with more providers who, are, who have the ability to provide the service, but these are the current mentors um, and those who have also been matched. Next slide, please. So just to access the service, whether you're um, a mentee, a mentor, a service coordinator, you want to refer someone, um, you can just contact me directly. We also have a form on our website that allows referrals to be submitted. We're always accepting referrals. We do a lot of the heavy lifting in terms of the matches, the initial intake, and just kind of um, coordinating even between the providers and, and all of that. So we try to make it as light as possible on um, other parties by taking on a lot of the initial steps. So like I said, you can email me, you can go to the website if you have questions or if you want to refer someone. That's it. We have your video on the next slide. Oh, perfect. Yes, so Eric will just click on the video link and then we can 
have Thank that. You. you can tell us about it if you care to. Um, so before we start it, it is going to be, I believe, oh, I feel bad. I believe it's three different mentors, Rebecca, Br Brittany, and Shay, and they essentially give from the mentor's perspective some information about the service that I kind of covered, um, but they do a better job than me, and they just kind of talk about why it's a great and important service. So who better than to hear from than the actual mentors themselves? Thank you. Would you please try to click on the link now? Thank you. Thank you for your patience while we try to connect the video. Eric, have we lost you? Are you there? Oh, you can't hear. Yeah, Sophia, what were you saying? So please click on the link for the video. Oh, I'm um it's playing. You can't see it? No. Ah, okay. Hold on. Can you hear it? No, I'm not. I don't know if others okay. are. All right, let me try again. Hold on a second. I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. And if we're unable to play the video when we send the slides out, um, we hope that the link okay. will work and you can How about, um, view it. How about now? Yes, it's showing what is a parameter. Now we just need the volume. OK, so it sounds like there's no volume and you can't actually hear it. So we'll just make sure that you can uh, click click the link or copy and paste the link from the slides once we send those out. Yes, okay. and again, um, thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Natasha Cooper. My pleasure. Thank, thank you for having me. Yes, ma'am. And next we have our employment and employment related outcomes. And this is with Miss Ramona Alfonso. Ramona, are you there? I am, Sophia. I was able to join a little earlier, so thank you. Hi, my name is Ramona DeFonza, and I'm a quality improvement specialist for Region 2. And I just thought it might be a great opportunity to share with all of you some of the things that we're working on at the Regional Quality Council level um, in Region 2. Next slide. We just wanted to update you. We all do quality improvement initiatives, all the subcommittees of the quality improvement councils at DBHDS. And our most recent for this fiscal year is uh, to improve the percent of ISPs that contain employment outcomes for those individuals who have a, a DD waiver from 32% to 42% by July of 2024. And the baseline data that we were using was 32.4% during fiscal year 23, quarter three. And again, this is region specific. A lot of times what we do is a quality improvement initiative in a specific region. And if we see success after studying that, then we kind of roll that out or make that to everyone. The first change that we did was try to identify a root cause and we did a root cause analysis. And then the second change that we did was to um, develop an ISP fact sheet, employment and employment related outcomes. And that's just a visual of what that fact sheet is uh, looking like. Next slide. 
So the purpose of the fact sheet is to provide definitions and information about writing employment and employment related outcomes, clarify issues they, that may otherwise be confusing or overlooked, and offer examples throughout. There was a lot of um, effort and energy from uh, community services, provider network services into developing this, along with our community members of the Regional Quality Council. Um, the audience is both for support coordinators and providers, even though the support coordinators are responsible for, you know, the outcomes. We know that the providers sit at that table in that meeting and advocate um, for the people that they're working with. And, um, you know, it becomes really important for everyone to be involved. The fact sheet is one page, two sided, and it's designed to be eye catching and user friendly. And the fact sheet replaces the previous employment outcomes one page document on the DBHDS website that was dated 12-21. So we'll, we'll let you know how, how this goes. We're looking for improvement. Next slide. Um, and the reason that we um, continued with developing a fact sheet for employment and employment, employment related outcomes was because year, um, the Regional Quality Council uh, too did a similar sort of uh, quality improvement initiative for community involvement, integrated community involvement. Uh, next slide. And our aim last year was to, by June 2023, increase the percentage of integrated community involvement outcomes found in ISPs for individuals receiving case management services in Region 2 from the baseline of 56% to 86%. You know, in hindsight, maybe we should have gone, you know, 56, maybe up 20 percentage points instead of a whole 30 percentage points. Uh, that was very ambitious. Our first change was to do a root cause analysis. Um, and a lot of times that's involving focus groups from providers, families, people who are participating in services, support coordinators, uh, et cetera. And then our second change was to develop the ISP fact sheet. Um, and the life area cheat sheet. So I just wanted to put up here um, in region two for fiscal year 24 and quarter one, this is after we rolled it out 77.4% and in quarter two at 76.5%. And there's a little bit of difference. I put the statewide numbers up there just for you to see. Statewide 1.5% and statewide um, quarter to 60%. So you can see in, in region two, which is the region we were studying, that um, we have an increase of, of 20%. It's not necessarily that people weren't doing this and there weren't um, uh, people who are participating in services weren't getting integrated community involvement. It's just that maybe we weren't capturing that data. We captured very specifically out of the ISP and with the WAMS data. And after some education and a little bit of, um, you know, uh, documentation and clarity, we saw for some CSBs a significant increase of 20 to almost 30 percent. And those, um, this fact sheet and the cheat sheet are available on our website through provider networks. And I'm not sure if you just click on there if that works, but I also have the links that I can put into chat for you. Um, and that was just our brief overview. We thought it would be nice to share with you um, some successes and so successes and so you could see what one of the regional quality councils is doing at the state level. And next slide, Eric, I think that's it. Thank you yep. very much. I appreciate the sure. information. And those Thank forms you. that she mentioned can be found on the web page for the Office of Provider Network Supports. And there you'll be able to open the documents. Thank you. And next we have Amy Britton, who is with the HCBS update. Hi, everybody. Um, good morning. Well, almost afternoon. Um, I just wanted to provide a really quick HCBS um, update to everyone. Um, if you can do the next slide. Um, pretty much this was as of January, kind of where we are with our reviews. Um, Alongside with DMAS residential settings, um, we have to get through all of settings by 12 2025. Um, we currently have 3,970 settings. 
We've completed 2,671 of those. Um, 704 are currently in progress and we have 588 left. Um, day settings, we're almost done with those. Um, 65 are in progress, we have 12 left. And then supportive employment, um, we have 17 active settings, eight are in progress and five are left. Um, next slide. Wanted to, um, we went over this last time, but just wanted to keep it kind of in the forefront um, of your mind, but you know, just some common remediation areas that we're seeing with providers. I'm not gonna read through each one, um, but a lot of the kind of stuff that we're seeing is um, forms, notes, um, leases, and so forth. Don't use person-centered language. Um, no proof that individuals actually have keys to their bedroom doors and um, the door of their home. Uh, modifications aren't being included and in, um, and documented in part five. Um, issues with lease agreements, not addressing uh, the reason for eviction and given the proper notice. Um, providers not understanding true community engagement. We're seeing a lot of all of the same individuals are going on the same activities at the same time. Um, and accessibility. Um, everyone in the home has to have access to all common areas. So that includes places like laundry room, um, office, you know, if there's, if the home has a loft, stuff like that. Next slide. Wanted to remind everyone that CMS is coming for their visit um, to the state of Virginia for the week of March 25th. Um, they will have three staff that will be conducting um, reviews going out as well as new addition staff. Um, the review teams plan on vi uh, visiting various providers throughout the state. Um, including CSBs, um, and they will also conduct interviews with provider staff, DBHDS and DMAS staff, case managers, and the individuals. Um, so again, they'll be coming out the week of March 25th. And then the last slide, next slide. These are just some um, CMS findings um, that they've been finding in different states um, as they go out. So we kind of wanted to give providers, you know, these are kind of the things that they're looking at. Um, again, the community outings, um, token systems um, for good behavior, individuals getting weekly allowance, not having access to and control over their finances, um, the modifications with the plans, um, individuals not having control over their schedules or activities, like when they um, choose to bathe, when they um, choose to eat, whether they want to go somewhere that day or not. Um, excessive signage in the homes, um, they view that as very institutional. You don't want to have medication times and stuff like that posted in the homes. Um, you want to reserve the individual's dignity. Um, there, when they earn in view and staff, staff aren't aware of HCBS regs. Um, they're seeing with some providers that staff wear uniforms. Um, and they view this also as um, institutional and showing you know, that clear, decides who's staff, who's the individual. Um, setting has visiting hours. Um, staff are just going into the individual's rooms without knocking and asking permission. Um, and then if there's any type of indoor cameras, um, they're not having, um, providers aren't showing consent and stuff for that. So that's a quick update. Um, just to keep HCBS in your mind. If you have any questions, just put those in the chat. And I think that's it. Thank you very much, Amy. And next we have um, Casey with the Office of Integrated Health, their dental team. Okay, um, can you hear me? Yes, please. Uh, okay, um, so um, I'm just going to talk about the dental form. Currently, we're doing um, paper dental forms. So on February 20th, we're going to have the, the live automated form available for people to fill out for the dental referrals. So just uh, before I start, just to reiterate that the dental program is still reserved for individuals who have a, a DD diagnosis who are over the or 21 and older. And there is a, a couple parts to our dental program. So so the dental referral is, is how they actually get uh, considered um, and we can go to the next slide. And these slides are going to go really fast because it's just screenshots of what you're going to see. So you just first go to the dental, uh, the DBHDS website, 
and obviously that's dbhds.virginia.gov. We can go to the next slide. Uh, office, then click on offices, then you can go to the next one. After you click on offices, we'll click on Office of Integrated Health. Then after that, you're going to scroll down to where it says dental, MRE, and nursing. And then once you click that, it's going to open up another screen and you just click dental again. And then you will click on the dental referral form icon there, and then it will prompt you to click the start now. And so what happens here is it will go through a series of, of boxes that you fill in. It's going to ask for the patient's information. It might ask for uh, the address of the patient and then the, the day program, the case manager information. Uh, it's going to ask for legal guardian information, health, health updates, medical um, medication lists, allergies, and all of those sort of things. I believe that there you have to put something in every box or it will kind of send you an error message that it's not complete. So when you're filling this out, just make sure that you are filling out all of the information. And so what happens after this is once you complete the dental referral form, it will automatically upload to the dental team's spreadsheet and uh, we will see it that it needs to be reviewed and our team reviews it make sure that the individual qualifies again that they're over 21 and over and that they have a dd diagnosis and then we will reach out and the first step is to be seen in the mobile dental van and we do that just to do a, a preliminary consult we meet with the individual we determine whether or not that the individual needs sedation dentistry or regular dentistry. And if we have someone in the community that we can actually refer them to, because we stick with a 50 mile or one hour uh, range for each individual. And then if we can't find someone in their area within that range, then we will see them in the dental van uh, for hygiene visits and things like that. So, so once we screen them to determine what kind of dentistry they need and where we can send them, then we would uh, schedule that. Um, we would refer them either to the dentist or um, retain them in the van. So, uh, the, but the current wait, there is a wait list right now. So uh, right now, if uh, you would were to put in a dental referral today, there's about a six week lead time to where we're processing them. And then probably another um, two to three month waiting list to get into the van. Uh, we have one team right now. We are expanding that. So we hope that the um, wait times will decrease soon. Uh, but as far as right now, um, we, we, we once you fill this out, you know, you will hear from us to schedule the mobile consult. Um, but it might not be um, for about six weeks when we get to process because uh, we go in the order that we receive them. And again, this is going to be um, live on the 20th. And I think uh, if you go to the next slide, it's just. Um, oh, wait, did they take out the other one? Oh, there, it's, OK, it's, yeah, so so basically. Um, any questions? about the dental referral it's once you get in there I tested it out and a couple of the other staff tested it out it's very easy to fill out it's very self-explanatory um, if you don't know something you can put unknown or something like that and then we can try to figure it out later we do like to have all of the contact information in there especially the CSB contacts and a, a best contact for scheduling the visits because that's important uh, so please try to make sure that that all is all populated in there before you hit submit. Um, and then this slide is just talking about the. Um, it's a program with VDH. They do the uh, oral health training with Cami Piscatelli. And so this is a little bit of information about that. There's one coming up um, on February 20th and that's free. It's it's really. Um, helpful for support um, support staff of individuals with disabilities. And so if you'd like to attend that, there's a registration link. I'm, I'm thinking that when they send this out, you'll be able to click on that link. And do that. And so that should be it. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you very much, Casey. Appreciate what's it. What's the link for the sign up for the training? And 
Next, we have the Office of Licensing. Thank you, Sophia. I'm here. Welcome. Good morning. Good afternoon. Are, are you all sharing <laughs> yes, my slides? Okay. Yes. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Thanks for having me. Move on to the next one. Uh, before I get started, I want to, we can go to the next slide. Just let you know what I'm going to be covering. Just going to talk a little bit about the DOJ settlement agreement uh, during my uh, presentation, the recent kickoff training we had related to the 2024 annual inspections. Going to hit on a few regulations specific to the systemic risk assessment and quality improvement plan, and then just a few tips and reminders related to various areas. We can move on. So as you all are aware, um, the Commonwealth continues to be tasked with showing compliance or progress towards a settlement agreement, um, as well as complying with inspection requirements per the state code and licensing regulations. So providers of developmental services receive an annual unannounced inspection each calendar year. Um, during that inspection, the Office of Licensing determines if providers have adequate risk management and quality improvement programs. Um, in addition to ensuring provider compliance as it relates to the adequacy of supports. So today I'm going to be reviewing some of those compliance indicators um, that we have yet to achieve and also uh, share some of those regulations that are specific to risk management and quality improvement um, and discuss how we can get there. Next. All right, so as many of you are aware, we are currently in full swing as it relates to our 2024 annual unannounced inspections for providers of developmental services. On January the 11th and 12th, um, due to some technical difficulties with teams, um, we held our kickoff training for 2024. Um, we had a little over a thousand attendees for both days. So if you did not have an opportunity to attend, I do wanna bring to your attention that we have the PowerPoint and the webinar posted on, the, on our website under additional trainings. We um, highly encourage you to check these out. So please make sure you, if you haven't, if you didn't attend, check these out. Next slide. Also during the kickoff training, we did remind providers that we do post the 2024 um, annual inspections of providers of developmental services memo. This is actually posted each year. Um, we reviewed several regulations that we have not met 86% compliance. Um, so as a reminder, this memo is updated annually based on feedback from providers and the DOJ independent reviewers. There's an attachment to this letter, um, which does list all the minimum regulations that the licensing specialist does review during that unannounced inspection. So that attachment is on page three. Um, Keep in mind that this resource was developed to assist you in preparing for our visits. Um, we do want your inspection to be a success, so we highly recommend that you review the memo, the attachment to the memo, our kickoff training as well. We can go to the next slide. All right, so compliance indicators 30.4 and 30.10 as it relates to the settlement agreement. Um, these remain in non-compliance. Um, but I know that with your hard work, we can make progress and we have made progress. Um, we've been unable to demonstrate that providers are currently using data at the individual and provider level, including data from serious incidents and investigations um, to identify and address trends and patterns of harm and risk of harm in the events reported. So those events that are reported in CRIS, as well as the associated findings and any recommendations. Um, in November of 2023, um, the Office of Licensing sent out through a constant contact and posted on the website the memo expectations regarding provider reporting measures for residential and day support providers of developmental services and expectations of provider risk management programs for all providers of developmental services. Um, this memo was posted for you all um, to assist in achieving compliance with indicator 30.10. I do encourage you to review it um, when you have an opportunity. Next. Here are some of the risk management resources available on our website. Um, we've got the risk management crosswalk, um, sample systemic risk assessments, the individual monthly risk, risk tracking tools, along with an instructional video. 
We also have serious incident and root cause analysis template, as well as the systemic risk assessment template. Next. Um, these are trainings related to risk management. Um, one of the trainings that's really important for um, providers is to watch the three part minimizing risk training, and that occurred in April of 2023. So if you haven't had an opportunity to review that, please do that as well. Next. All right, um, as a reminder, licensed providers are required to conduct an annual systemic risk assessment. Um, a systemic risk assessment review must be completed at least annually to identify and respond to practices, situations and policy that could policies that could result in the risk of harm to individuals receiving services. The risk assessment should address at least the following environment of care, clinical assessment or reassessment processes, staff competence and adequacy of staffing use of high risk procedures, including seclusion and restraint, a review of serious incidents, and the systemic risk assessment must incorporate uniform risk triggers and thresholds, which we call care concerns. Now I wanna take a few minutes to focus on 520C5. This regulation is specific to indicator 30.4. Um, the provider must have documented evidence that they have completed an analysis of trends from their quarterly re review of serious incidents identify potential systemic issues or causes, indicated remediation, and planned implemented steps taken to mitigate potential for future incidents. I want to emphasize that this includes identifying year-over-year -year trends and patterns and the use of baseline data to assess the effectiveness of risk management systems. So I have a couple of questions on the next slide that are helpful. Um, and you should ask yourself this as you are completing 520C5s as it relates to the systemic risk assessment. So do we use data at the individual and or provider level, including at minimum data from incidents and investigations to identify and address trends and patterns of harm and risk of harm defined as care concerns in the events reported? Is there evidence that we are tracking data to evaluate trends and patterns over time, including year over year as applicable? After a year of tracking data, did we use the baseline data to assess the effectiveness of our risk management system? So do you have baseline data? And if so, are you doing this? Is it documented? Did we use this data to summarize findings and make recommendations, which may include remediation and planned and implemented steps taken to mitigate the potential for future incidents? Make sure this is documented so that it can be provided uh, during your inspection. Again, make sure that you have documented evidence related to your review of serious incidents. The Office of Licensing will be asking for this information. Um, this is an area of focus for the independent reviewer and his consultants as it relates to the G DOJ settlement agreement. Now we're going to switch gears to indicator 43.1. So unfortunately, we have not come into compliance with this one either. Um, as you're aware, DBHDS uses data from serious incidents the risk awareness tool, and the individualized service plan to report on positive and negative aspects of health and safety. DBHDS will utilize data from quality service reviews, the semi-annual report, national core indicators, and ISPs for positive and negative aspects of community integration. Provider reporting measures must A, assess both positive and negative aspects of health and safety and of community integration. It's important to know that DBHDS was relieved of a complementary indicator that required providers to report that data separate and distinct from other data reported. So how does that impact you? Let's take a look at the next slide. All right, as you're aware, all providers are supposed to have a quality improvement plan. This is specific to regulation 620C, one through five. The quality improvement plan should be reviewed and updated at least annually. Define measurable goals and objectives. Include and report on statewide performance measures, if applicable. Monitor implementation and effectiveness of approved corrective actions. Include ongoing monitoring and evaluation of progress toward meeting established goals and objectives. So prior to 2024, DBHDS was collecting data internally as it related to 620C3. Let's now take a closer look 
at what the change related to reporting on statewide performance measures looks like for your organization. All right, so providers are expected to track community integration as a statewide performance measure through their quality improvement plan as required by 620C3. To meet this requirement, each residential and day support provider, this is applicable to residential and day support providers, they have to have in their QI plan a specific measurable goal and objectives that addresses meaningful work or meaningful community inclusion as defined by the Division of Developmental Services. We have included these definitions here for you on the slide. Next slide. Uh, additionally, the memo that I referenced earlier when I was talking about indicator 30.10, um, it also includes the expectations regarding the provider reporting measures. Um, so again, please review these memos that we've posted. They are located under the correspondence section on our website. I cannot emphasize that enough. Let's go on to the next slide. In that memo, DBHDS provided examples of measurable goals and objectives to assist residential and day support providers with addressing 620C3. These examples are directly, the, the examples on the slide are directly from the memo. And if you feel that they will work for your organization and the individuals that you serve, feel free to use them. During the 2024 annual inspection, the licensing specialists will review the quality improvement plan to determine if residential and day support providers of developmental services have developed measurable goals and measurable objectives to address meaningful work or meaningful community inclusion. If a provider has met the requirement, they will be given a rating of compliant for 620C3. Providers who have not developed a measurable goal and measurable objectives will be given a rating of non-determined in 2024 in lieu of a, a non-compliant citation and technical assistance will be provided. Additionally, information related to compliance with 620C3 will be reviewed or assessed during quality service reviews. Next. All right, now I've got just a couple of reminders um, related to various regulations. This one actually has to do with corrective action plans. So please make sure that corrective action plans are submitted by the due date. The due date is always listed at the bottom of the licensing report. An immediate corrective action plan will be required if the department determines that the violation, I'm sorry, the violations pose a danger to individuals receiving the service, which should be identified as a health and safety cap. If an extension is needed, it must be requested through Connect prior to the due date. Extensions will not be given for health and safety violations. The provider must monitor implementation and, effect and effectiveness of, proof of approved corrective action plans as part of their quality improvement plan. There has been a notable increase in providers not submitting their corrective action plan by the due date. Providers that do not submit or implement their corrective action plan may be subject to progressive action, such as a reduction in the license status, denial, or even revocation of a license. We can go to the next one. Thank you. Um, just a couple of reminders related to on-site reviews. Um, it was, it's really important that providers maintain their designated office hours so that on-site reviews can be completed. Um, delays in us being able to conduct our inspection may result in a provider not receiving their license on time. If the Office of Licensing arrives for an inspection and no one is present, we will typically make a phone call. Um, we do expect a return call within 30 minutes to an hour. In many cases, we are making phone calls while we're on site during the provider's designated office hours and no one is present. Um, so please make sure that you maintain your normal business hours and that they are posted so that we are aware of your hours. Additionally, please make sure that the main authorized contact and other contacts and connect are kept up to date in case we need to contact someone from your organization. Next slide. 
All right, regarding renewals, do not forget, submit your renewal and provide proof of SEC prior to the expiration of your license. Um, you will need to sign and submit the renewal using the Connect Provider Portal. As a reminder, Connect sends a notification 90 days prior to the license expiring. It is recommended that the renewal be submitted at least 30 days prior to the license expiring. Submitting it the day the, before the license expires is not acceptable. We need to do better. Okay. Um, also, prior to submitting the renewal, please review the addendum to determine if any services or locations need to be closed and submit that information with the renewal. Once the license has been renewed, it is the expectation that the providers review their license and the addendum to ensure the accuracy of license services and locations listed. Last slide. All right, so we do have some exciting news coming from the Office of Licensing. Um, we will be providing small group license provider coaching sessions. Um, the first session is specific to providers of developmental services who are non-compliant with any of the risk management and or quality improvement regulations. Space is limited. If you are selected to participate, you will receive an invite from the Office of Licensing. If you are registered for the constant contact with the Office of Licensing, then you should have received the flyer and the survey yesterday afternoon. I know we had a lot of people um, starting to fill those out and submit those. So they will be screened and we will reach out to the provider if you're selected. Um, we also are going to be making some updates to our website. We're going to be sending out a survey for that. We definitely want your feedback. Um, lastly, we are going to be posting a website index in the next few weeks. This is a tool that is going to be available on our website directly above the correspondence section. The tool will allow users to search for documents, resources, trainings um, located on the website. It can be downloaded and filtered by topic area, um, the diagnosis, and even the date. So hopefully you guys will find these tools helpful. That's all I have for you. Thank you, Mackenzie. I hope you guys um, realize the value of what was shared today and the support that's being offered. Again, we will have these slides available to you through the listserv once we're done today um, and hopefully by the end of the week. Next, we have Office of Human Rights with uh, Ms. Tanika. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Welcome. That's great. Thank you, Sophia. Um, so yeah, my name is Tanika Goldman. I have the good pleasure of being the director for the Office of Human Rights, and we've just got a couple of updates I want to share with everyone. This first slide kind of outlines the things that I'm going to be talking about. And so um, the next slide is the first thing, which is provider training. And I'm so excited to be able to announce that we have filled the vacancy for our training and development coordinator. Um, that person is Alonzo Riggins. He's already begun to um, resume our quarterly trainings. His contact information is going to be on the last slide if you have questions specific to our trainings, but here you can see that we're continuing to offer reporting in Chris, investigating abuse and neglect, overview of human rights, and a training about restrictions, behavioral treatment plans, and restraints. Um, additionally, we are working on developing some resources for professionals who are not licensed or regulated by the department, and so they aren't subject um, necessarily to the human rights regulations, but they work with providers and individuals who are. One thing that's really come about has to do with, for example, licensed behavioral analysts or PBSFs who are helping to develop and write, in some cases, restrictive behavioral treatment plans. And so we want to be able to give them some guidance around the expectations providers have and the rights that individuals have. So um, you can be on the lookout for those resources. Um, the next slide is just making you aware that there is new guidance um, both on our website and on Town Hall that became effective February 1st of this year, specific to reporting peer-on-peer -peer aggressions as potential neglect. Um, so this guidance really just gives defined terms so you know what peer-on-peer -peer aggressions are. It also outlines the expectations we have around internal review by providers. Um, and then there are examples of reportable incidents. Again, this is specific to reporting peer-on-peer -peer aggressions to the Office of Human Rights. It doesn't impact what's reportable to the Office of Licensing. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. 
Um, also on our website right next to this new guidance is an optional internal review and tracking tool. So for those providers that haven't had the opportunity to begin to do that, um, that is necessary to your services. And so we've got a tool. Again, that tool is optional if you haven't started doing something on your own. The next slide talks about the community look behind, which I'm hoping everybody's familiar with. Um, in short, this is just a process that our office uses to review closed abuse neglect investigations by providers, so CSBs and licensed community providers of DD services specifically. Um, right now, we're reviewing a sample of cases that was closed between January 1 and January 31 of 2024, so we're much closer to real time than we've ever been in the past. In November of last year, we actually published to our website a year-to-date summary of our results, and that was inclusive of cases that were reviewed and closed between January 1 and September 30 of 2023. I would encourage you to go take a look at that. We found some really interesting trends that have to do particularly with um, having trained investigators to conduct abuse neglect investigations and making sure that those investigators are actually um, interviewing or collecting witness statements from everyone involved, including the individuals to the extent possible. And then making sure that those investigations are done within the 10 working days or that there is an extension requested. So again, on our website, you can find those year-to-date results, um, and we should be publishing a year-long um, results very soon. This is just a reminder that per the human rights regulations, licensed providers are required to submit an annual report of each instance of seclusion or restraint, or both, for each licensed service by January 15th of each year. Um, the information that we get is used to help identify trends and assess system-wide use of seclusion and restraint. And we try to use this information to develop educational materials. Um, what we learned from data collected in calendar year 2022 was that we had a response rate of 48%, and that just really is unacceptable because this is a requirement. Um, so we started a quality improvement initiative trying to own some of that um, responsibility with providers. Um, and that really involved us making direct phone calls to a subset of providers who submitted everything on time, submitted something for all services, to providers that didn't submit anything, to providers that had submitted partial information, and just tried to get some feedback about, you know, what were the barriers? What would what could we do better or differently to help providers be compliant with that? And so we took that feedback and we we implemented some of that. And so we notified providers as early as November, or I should say reminded providers of the requirement. Um, we used our list serve that is really through the Office of Licensing. And I'll have information for those that aren't getting our communication to sign up for that. And then we also tried something different and sent information out through Connect, which was really complicated. And unfortunately, we can't do it that way again. But in addition to that, we posted um, resources on our website and communicated that in those memos, including creating a step-by-step -step video with audio instruction about how to complete the survey and when to complete the survey. We also embed instructions in the survey if there were questions while you were completing it. Um, and so fast forward, we opened up the survey at midnight on the 31st of December 2023, and we actually didn't close that survey until five days after it was due, January 20th. At this point in time, 3,354 of the 4,503 responses we were accepting were still going through. So if you're doing the math real quick, that's about a 74.5% response rate, unfortunately. I do think that number is going to go down as we go line by line, which we're doing, um, and we're learning that some providers have only submitted information for a handful of the services they're licensed for. Um, and then naturally, we're trying to get it down to be able to determine who we didn't get any information for, because the information is what we're after, right? We're not just trying to identify who didn't report. Um, once we know who those providers are, our plan is to reach out to those providers directly extend grace yet again so that they can provide that information. And then after that additional opportunity for grace has been exhausted and we don't get information, we will issue citations for providers that have not submitted the required information. 
The next slide is really um, just another call for volunteers. As you're all aware, the local human rights committees and the state human rights committee are built on volunteers, um, volunteers that are individuals who have or are currently receiving services, healthcare providers and other professionals. And so we have 17 LHRCs across the Commonwealth. About half of them currently have vacancies. And so this slide is just a reminder that you can find the actual LHRC application and the kind of one page information sheet on our website. If you know of anyone that's interested or that you think might be a wonderful asset to the LHRC, please share that information or let us know and we can share that information with them directly. The next slide is really just a colorful um, map about where our regional managers and our manager for state operated facilities can be contacted. So if you're not sure where you fall, you're not sure who the advocate is, these are your direct points of contact. And then the last slide is um, information about how you can make sure you are signed up on the listserv that we use to push out all of the information I shared, right? So we put out the um, new guidance document that way. We put out reminders about the annual seclusion restraint. So if you didn't get any of that, please follow the instructions in the first two lines on this slide. I also have Alonzo's, um, oh, and it looks like I got his email wrong. I have him as Alonzo Riggings and it's Alonzo Riggins. So it's his name at dbhds.virginia.gov. So you're able to contact him or go on our website if you have questions about um, provider training sessions. And I think that's all I have from the Office of Human Rights. I'll stick around to see if there's any questions in the chat that I can address. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Tanika. And I believe I did see a question. Um, next, we have Jen Krause, who's with the Office of Provider Network Supports, updating us on informed choice. Jen? Thanks, Sophia. Hi, everybody. Um, I just have a very quick update as a reminder um, that everybody who receives Medicaid waiver services has the right to choose from all services and all providers who are willing and qualified. Um, we are continuing to see uh, situations where providers will inform a support coordinator that they want to add a service on behalf of the person and choosing the providers. Um, this the whole process really needs to come from the support coordinator because by regulation, again, they have to offer a choice of all of the available providers. So if you are a provider and you're seeing a need with an individual that you're supporting, um, I recommend having a team conversation about that and allow the support coordinator to do their job in offering choice. And then the second reminder is that services must be necessary and appropriate to the person's needs. Um, we're seeing situations where providers are just off providing a service to somebody and then switching that. So, for instance, from uh, personal assistance to in-home supports. And as Diane mentioned earlier, in-home supports is an active service. It's a skill building service. It may not be appropriate to the person's needs. Um, so we need to make sure that we're looking at that and only putting in the services and supports that are necessary and appropriate. That's all I had. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you, Jen. If you have any questions about informed choice, please put those in the chat. Next, we have um, April Dobell talking about the crisis services. Next slide, please, Eric. Hi everyone. Yes, so I'm April Dovell. Um, I'm the Director of Crisis Services here at DBHDS. Um, so at the top of the uh, slide, you'll notice that we have our website listed for where you can receive information and you can access information regarding crisis services. I will say, please bear with us. We are um, in the process of updating all of the information on our website. So if you have any specific questions about crisis services, you can um, see that we have the regional contacts listed below. Um, this is a pretty short, um, comprehensive update I hope to give you, but um, what the Commonwealth has been working towards is a crisis now model. So there is someone to call, someone to respond, and somewhere to go. And where that falls in line with the REACH program is that now if an individual um, that you may be serving is in need of crisis services, they can call uh, a 988 number. So 988 uh, patches through to the call center. Um, we have two call center vendors across the Commonwealth for each um, regions, one, uh, three, 
regions one, two, four, and five all have the same call center vendor, and then region three has another call center vendor. Anyway, a call comes into 988, and then it's pushed through to the REACH uh, team so they can be dispatched to the scene um, of the crisis. So um, please know that all pre-existing REACH lines are still in operation, and if someone were to call them, they would still be able to receive a mobile crisis response if, if needed. Um, Again, our divisional contacts are at the bottom of uh, the slide deck, and so just for your general awareness, our um, Assistant Commissioner of Crisis Services is Kurt Gleason. Bill Howard is the Director of Crisis Operations, so his team works on developing data points, building out new site locations and all things uh, operations for the crisis system, and my team uh, being the director of crisis services, we would um, oversee any type of technical assistance and provide um, feedback and support to the providers that are in the field providing crisis services across uh, the Commonwealth. So thank you for all you do. And that's all I have, Sophia. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for April about crisis services or any other information that was shared today? We'll turn our attention to the chat if there are no questions, and Barry will help us to start with the chat questions that are listed. And if those presenters are still online, they will offer additional answers if they have not yet placed something in the chat. So Barry, are you there? And can you take us to the questions at the top? And thank you guys for your attention and for staying with us. All of the information is vital to you doing a successful work and the individuals receiving the services that they're applying for. So thanks again, and we'll get to our Q&A. Eric, is there anything that you'd like to share? Um, <clears throat> not uh, particular, particularly. I do see some folks asking about how to get on the listserv, how to locate the CRC contact chart. So all of that, if you go to the DBHDS website at dbhts.virginia.gov and you look at the top and it says um, uh, get in getting, help. getting help. If you go to getting help, you'll get a drop down menu. If you hover over getting help, then on the far right hand side, if you go down that column, um, you're going to see provider network supports. And if you go to that link, then you're going to find announcements and under announcements is the current CRC contact chart, as well as a link to join the listserv. Thank you, Eric. Oh, and I, I will add, we will um, today send these slides out through the listserv as a follow up to that initial um, invite. And um, once we get the recording and the Q&A done, we'll get those on the provider network uh, supports page as well. Um, thank you. We appreciate all of our departmental representers today and the wealth of information. So if you're able to stick around for the Q&A, that would be wonderful. If not, um, we will contact you if we're not able to answer questions specific to your office. Barry, are you able to unmute and? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So okay. I'm scrolling, and scrolling down. Many, many of the questions, uh, comments, and chat were already answered. Okay, so we great. Get, get to the ones that weren't answered. Okay. Um, there was a question from. Oops, sorry. I think that was answered. Sorry. A lot of comments with the volume. There was a request for the waitlist link to be put in the chat. I'm not, I don't see that, so maybe someone could put that in there. Mackenzie, I see a question that may be for you. They want to know who they can contact about licensing at the Office of Licensing. I'm not sure what they're asking. Maybe you have a general sure, um, number. Licensing admin support 
at dbhds.virginia.gov that should go, I believe, let me double check to make sure that's correct. Am I just making that up? I don't think so. Um, let me make sure that's the correct. Chat. Yeah, if you find it, you drop it in the okay. chat. Okay, and please. then the question will be routed to the appropriate person, so I'll, I'll add that. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. I saw something also about NCI. Not sure what they were asking for. I think somebody was responding to the statewide performance measures. I also answered okay. that question. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, there's a, there's one in here from someone said I got kicked out and had to rejoin with someone mind to put the email addresses in there from the beginning of the presentation related to LOC level of care needs. And I did not yeah, see thanks. that addressed. Yeah, I don't know if Diane is still on, but let me see if she had it in her presentation. One moment, please. OK, I'll keep scrolling down. Yeah, we're, there's a question, is this for non-licensed organizations too? Um, but I don't know what that's referencing because it wasn't answered here. OK, for those of you on the chat in the agenda, underneath the list of presenters, there's uh, quite a wealth of information. And if you go to the very bottom, you'll see the um, who to contact where you can find the information about the LOC. You can find a link there. So if you open up the agenda and scroll all the way to the very last pages, you'll see photo contact and Diane made reference to that in the beginning. I think that should answer your question. There's a question, how do you address control over their finances when they're not their own payee and they have a set allowance amount? Is there anybody here that can answer that question? Is Amy Britton still on? I think that came out of the ACBS piece. OK, we can cover these later. Um, if the individual has a lease in a group home and they decide to leave, are they still responsible for the duration of the lease? I will have to put that one out later. Who should we send justification to for parent to work as a DSP to their adult individual? There was an okay. answer to Radana's question below. That was one question about Radana Johnson. Forgive me if I'm pronouncing your name wrong. That was answered. The agenda was sent out through the listserv. And we will also send the slides out through the listserv. If we need to reattach the agenda, we can do so. So please put your email in the chat if you did not get to this meeting by that invitation. Yeah, there was a couple questions about CMS coming on the 25th and those were addressed you know, about being notified, but and it was put in here, providers who will be visited have already been contacted. Several questions on that. That was raised. There's a question about will you need to redo the dental forms if the paper ones have already been sent in? So, question about do they have to go into the system in, in their in electronic version or will the paper ones be honored? Then there was an answer to the control of the finances put in here by Lisa, so thank you. 
Also about the lease. Answer was typically lease a state at 30 day notice. Like I said, many of these were answered directly, so thank you for that, for those that were monitoring and answering questions as we went along. Uh, question about wh will there be more oral health trainings? Then there was one, what's the link to sign up for that training? I'm not sure which training. And a statement from someone that said the link for training isn't working. A lot of statements tell us about which the, training they're referring to. And it says the link, link is not working for the oral training. I believe there was a series of those, so I believe it's about that training. Okay. The dental oral training. Diane answered one of the questions about the OWD in here. Several questions Diane answered, so thank you for that, Diane. DD answered several questions related to her talk. There was a question out who pays for the service for um, Natasha's discussion about peer mentor. Additional ones where a lot of I can't hear audio. We'll resolve that. A lot of resources were put in the chat also for others to click in or copy the links. Yeah. Mary, I see a question about um, ECT that okay. we can we can give a little update on. Um, so we have worked with DMAS to develop an employment and community transportation toolkit um, that has been through our provider issues resolution work group. Um, DMAS has approved it. Um, I think where we're at right now is because a couple of the DMAS forms changed, we need to determine whether or not the forms need to go through public comment or what steps need to be taken um, to make the toolkit available because those DMAS forms are included in it. Um, so we'll, we'll get an update out as soon as we can and release that. So that should help increase uh, ECT providers um, in the state, we really wanted to make it easy for providers to understand uh, the requirements and how to offer the service and then provide some tools and resources that they could use to document uh, the provision of the service. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to get that out soon. All right, thank you, Eric. Um, how should we providers track meaningful day? There I would just suggest contacting your community resource consultant on the provider team for your region. I think Mackenzie spoke to that and had some examples. Right, so right. maybe they can reach out as well to their licensing specialist because she had examples in her slides. Again, a lot of I'm scrolling through and a lot of them are already answered, so. Good to have lots of people on here who can answer questions. There's a question that in regard to excessive signage, does that include the front door signs required by licensing for no weapons or surveillance monitoring? For any questions related to licensing, if you're a licensed provider, pr please contact your licensing specialist. You can get the name of the special of your specialist and connect. Um, it, it should be associated with any inspections or licensing reports you've received. Thank you. Uh, someone asking where you can find the new objective written documentation form. 
at this point you can contact your CRC or Eric, can we get that posted on our web page? It's, it's, it's also in the agenda. It's in okay, the agenda. Good. Yes. All right. So it's there. Majority there was a question. Of what was, okay. Never mind. Go ahead. I was just letting them know majority of the forms that was um, talked about, they were in the agenda. So for those who weren't on the list, sir, you will get your emails and we'll send this along with the other information. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, and Sophia, I did add a uh, comment in chat that says join the listserv here, and it okay. has the, the actual link for folks to sign up if you want to go ahead and sign yourself up. Okay. There was a question about reach services. Are they allowed to be done virtually? Reach services um, should be done face to face, especially the crisis assessment. Um, however, a family member or an individual can specifically request for a virtual assessment, but we're highly encouraging all reach teams to provide face to face crisis assessment. Uh, there was a question about. Um, Statement about minimum wage going up as of January 2025. Will the state be providing another provider rate increase soon? Can someone put the link in here real quick? Someone was asking. Oh, someone did. Never mind. Dorcas did it. Thank you. I just see it there, Dorcas. The link how to get to our contact information. I think that's it. Okay. Yeah. We thank everyone for their time, their participation, the questions. As always, we will take the information from chat. We will compile them into a Q&A and we will put them on the Office of Provider Network Supports webpage that can be found at bbhds.virginiaspeltout.gov. Then you go to get in help. And we're in the third column on the right, midway down. That's where you can find our office page. Thank you again and have a great day and happy Valentine's to everyone. Take care until the next time we meet.